Welcome to the Radical Lifestyle Podcast, brought to you by Generation to Generation, where you will be inspired by the past, equipped for the present, and prepared for the future, as we engage in conversations with people from around the world. Hello everyone, this is Andrew and Daphne from Generation to Generation, and our guest today is Scott Wilson. Scott, for people that don't know who you are, can you just say a bit about where you're from and what you do? Sure. Uh, I have been pastoring the same church in Dallas, Texas, here, Oaks Church, for 30 years. Just transitioned, brought back a, a staff member that's a son in the Lord and his wife, a daughter. They, they came back to us after 13 years and took the church, just transitioned, only 52. So it's not like I was like, uh, oh, man, we were barely holding on. Man, we were killing it. It was going awesome. But the Lord just told me it was time. They came in, and so now we're working with churches and raising up spiritual fathers and mothers who are believing that every generation is going to get bigger, better, and stronger in the church because they're getting to start from, uh, you know, instead of from scratch, they're starting from a spiritual inheritance. So it's pretty cool stuff that we're getting to do now. But, man, I love what you guys do. Like, it's everything that's in my heart, everything that I believe in, the generation to generation. That's why I love you guys. Well, you've got us excited even before we started. <laughs> so we can't wait to get into this. Really, really can't. Uh, for people that listen to this, they say, I like this Scott guy. I like the sound of what he's doing. Where could they go and find out more? Yeah, you can go to RSG. That's Ready, Set, Grow. That's the name of uh, our ministry rsgleaders.com or uh, 415leaders.com. Two different ministries that we lead to help pastors become spiritual fathers and mothers, but some of them, they need their church to grow with them in that multiplying church mindset. And so we started a three-year journey called Ready, Set, Grow. So rsgleaders.com. Either one of those, you're going to find out who we are and what we're doing is pretty, I think is pretty exciting. Okay, so for people listening, those links will be in the description box so that they're ready for you to go and check out. Cool. So, Scott, we, we want to hear all about this. I've, I'm going to read the quote. Okay. We would have loved to have you on anyway. I mean, we had you lined up. When I heard this, I thought, no, we, we just got <laughs> we to We need to do, hurry this thing we up. We need to hurry this up. <laughs> so this is what I think I read on your Instagram. Success is not about the stages you stand on, but those who stand on our shoulders. And, of course, as you say, that resonates with everything that we are. I wish I thought exactly. of that. I wish I thought of it ourselves. We're not clever enough. We need people no. like Scott to come along and help <laughs> we us. We need well, Scott to come along. This, <laughs> I'm, I'm not clever enough. Let me tell you where that came from. But um, Early on in my life, you know, in my 20s, I grew up, my dad's a pastor, right? No. Uh, my whole life, my mom's dad, my dad's dad were pastors. So we're third generation. And so in my young 20s, I felt something in my life that God was calling me to something that was going to be great powerful, important, strategic, you know, I just felt something in my heart, but I got a little antsy and frustrated. Like, God, if you've called me to do something great, why don't you tell me what it is? I mean, why is it like, I got to sit around. I feel like I, I'm, I don't have it. And I just got, I, I got really kind of upset and angry. And here's what my dad told me. Cause he, he saw me praying one time, he, you know, uh, there's a pastor that Tommy Barnett, that was a great pastor, pastor here. He still is with his sons, you know, and I was listening to him and he, he got up and he said, listen, we're a soul winning church. You know, and we just tell everybody, find a need and fill it, find a hurt and heal it. And I just got mad with God just going like, man, if you would give me a line like that, I could really do something. <laughs> wow. if you just give me something, you know, and I went to the altar when he said, hey, God wants to speak to a vision. Uh, and I'm only 19 at this point. I go down and I pray and I say, God, speak to me. Give me the vision. Tell me what you want me to do. And I remember just down there praying. And all of a sudden, I heard the voice of the father and I felt his hand on my shoulder. And, and the voice said, hurry up, Scott. We're hungry. Let's go eat. <laughs> it was my, my, not my heavenly father. It was my earthly dad. <laughs> oh, well. Can we use that quote? <laughs> yes. So he said, hurry up. We're hungry. All the staff's awake. So when we got in the car, I was just mad. And he said, why are you so mad? I said, I feel like God's called me to do something, but he won't tell me what to do. 
He pulled the car over to the side, put it in park and looked at me and said, really? He hasn't told you what to do. And I said, no, I, I, I mean, he won't give me the vision. He won't tell me. He said, how about if we just do the great commandment? Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Hey, what if you got that down? Maybe when you get that down, he'll tell you the specifics of where and how and all that. And I thought that was so powerful. So I started living on that. I'm just going to start loving God with everything I am and loving people. Love God, love people. But God, you'll give me the clarity as I, as I lean into that. It was a two years later or so that one night in the middle of the night, I had a dream. The dream of my life. So in the dream, I'm preaching to this outdoor crusade on an elevated platform. There's this wooden podium in front of me. People can see me from the crowd from the waist up, but not down because I'm behind the podium. In the dream, I look down and there's a cut out hole in the platform. And my dad is standing in that hole mm. and I'm standing on his shoulder. His hands around my ankles like this, tears coming down his face as he's praying in the spirit for me. And at that moment, God spoke to me and said, to everybody else who sees you, they, they think you're standing on a platform that you built for yourself, when in reality, you're standing on the shoulders of your father. Mm. Wow. And as I woke up, I was going, I'm going to call dad and thank him in the morning. But why are you showing this to me? He said, because son, the calling of your life, the way your life and ministry will be defined. And now I'm only 21 years old. But he says the, the definition of your life in ministry, the calling I have for you is this. It will not be defined by the stages you preach on, the stages you stand on, but by those who stand on your shoulders. Hmm. And so even Daphne, even at that time, I felt at 21, how can I be kind of that father for people? Because I'm only 21 years old. Now, maybe I could be a dad to the kids church or whatever. And, and there's some of that. But that's when the Lord started showing me that spiritual fathering or having that heart for the next generation. That's a heart issue, not an age issue. Fathering is all about the heart. It's all about I care about you for you. You know, and, and that was the beginning of it. It's not like I had it all together. God had to keep like layers of an onion dealing with issues of my heart and wanting to be important and wanting to be famous or wanting to be successful, you know, but really that became the whole deal for me. And that's how over the last 30 years of me being at the church, we had over 600 people out of our church going to full-time ministry. Why? Because I wasn't thinking just about building the, the church central at our place and keeping everybody there. That's fathers who care about just gathering around them sons and daughters to not grow up. Uh, but, but my goal is not to just raise up sons and daughters, it's to raise up fathers and mothers. That is amazing. And the quote that we have, which is similar to that, is that the ceiling of one generation should be the floor of the next. How, exactly. high, how high is your ceiling and who you're putting on it? Yeah. And um, we were... Beautiful. We were down the... Uh, we were talking to somebody um, whose father passed us down the Amazon River, reaching the tribes down there, and he was telling us we went there um, 20, 18 years ago. Yeah. And after we had been, he was going to go and be a doctor in Sao Paulo. And he said, I've never forgotten what we heard you say. And I thought to myself, why would I go and build my own house when I can build on the floor, on the ceiling of my right. father's house. And he he didn't go, and he is now pastoring with his father and helping his father reach the Amazon River. So how this plays out, how it's playing out for you, how it plays out for this young man who is now down the Amazon, going down in boats and everything and reaching these tribes. And, and now help. being raised up to eventually take over from his dad. Right. Now, yeah. So it, it plays out and it looks differently in different places, but it is exactly the same heart, exactly the same heart. Yeah. Think about it. if every generation of the church could start at the floor, the ceiling of their father, the ceiling of their spiritual father, biological father, whatever it is. If every generation was thinking that way, it's, it's Malachi four, five, and six. Totally. The last two verses saying, Hey, 
the spirit of Elijah is going to come and he's going to turn the hearts of fathers to sons and daughters, sons and daughters back to their fathers in the curse. You know, it says, lest the curse come, but it's also could be said, so the curse can be broken when that yeah. happens, you know, mm-hmm. and we see such a curse in our world that comes from fatherlessness. But he saw a day that wasn't just about dads, uh, you know, uh, being like in the civil war here in the States, we lost like 800,000 dads or 8,000, 800,000 men at one time. So there was a fatherlessness because there was a lot of death. The days we live in now and the days that Malachi was seeing is days that there would be dads. They're just not around. And he says, I'm going to turn their hearts to sons and daughters, turn the hearts of sons and daughters to, to dads. And that is key on the spirit of Elijah. Now, Pentecostals and charismatics like me, we, it would feel better to be Elisha. Man, we're going to have the double portion. Come on. God's going to give us the spirit of Elisha. You know, that preaches better. Why isn't it Elisha and not Elijah? I think it's because when Elijah went up, the mantle was left to Elisha. He said, what do you want? He said, I want a double portion of what you got. He says, it's yours if you're with me till the end. And that it fell upon Elisha. And Elisha did two times the miracles that Elijah did and all this. But when Elisha died, the king came to him and he's there and, and he's saying, hey, what about the chariots and horsemen of Israel? What about Israel and the next generation? If you're about to die, what are we going to do? He didn't have anybody there to give a mantle to. He just gave him instruction. Hey, hit the ground with the arrows. Shoot the arrow out. Oh, man, you only hit the ground three times. This isn't about keep hitting the ground. It's about a prophet who got a double portion that could have given another quadruple portion. He could have been a double of a double. Hmm. But it says he died and they buried him. And you know what it says right after that? It says he died and they buried him. Then a year later, some Moabite raiders were coming in and they were a guy was dead and they, they were trying to bury him. And so they had to throw him in the tomb of Elisha. And right when he touched the bones of Elisha, he rose up from the dead. Now we get excited in the charismatic world sometimes to be able to see look, the ministry of people who are really on fire for God keeps going after they're dead. No, that isn't what the passage is talking about. The passage is it's one of the saddest passages in the Bible for people who believe like you and I do in this. Because why? Because it says that the double portion, the quadruple portion was in a grave lying dormant instead of thriving in a son. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, people don't often, well, hardly ever notice that every model of discipleship in the Bible was generational. Yes. Every model, whether you take Ruth and Naomi, Paul and Timothy, whether you take Moses, Joshua, etc., etc., it's all generational. And I think you're firing us up over here, right? So I think one <laughs> don't of... Don't make me hold you back. <laughs> no, no, don't, don't, don't. There's two of them that I really... Well, I love them all because we speak on all different aspects different of it. different elements yeah. of them, yeah. yeah. But if you take Moses and Joshua, for example, yeah. Moses trained Joshua going round and round in the desert. That's where he discipled him. That's where he gave his life to him. That's where he lived life with him. But... Moses trained Joshua for a land he'd never been to, to fight battles he'd never fought, to lead a people he'd never led. He trained Joshua so well that even after he died, Joshua could still say, remember what Moses said, remember what Moses said. And I think sometimes the danger when we want to disciple the next generation is to use that phrase, well, it was good enough for me, it's good enough for you. And I'm like, no. And when we say this in a conference, all the young people there, they sit up and they think, oh, we're I on like our team. Guys. But we've got to prepare the next generation for days we haven't lived through. Exactly. We've got to do that. And and then the other one is um, Mordecai and Esther. And Mordecai, have we always focus on Esther and, you know, born for such a time as this, and it's become mm. a T-shirt thing. And it's nice become, catchphrase. Yeah, it's on, it's on the walls and that. And it wasn't a T-shirt phrase. It's a life-defining moment. And, and she right. was going to have to give her life. Why, did Morde- why could Mordecai say that? Why could he look her in the eyes and say that? Because he had already 
put his own life on the line. And I think this mm-hmm. is a generational thing. Awesome. It isn't that you're just passing on. The generation before, we got to go out and put our lives on the line so that we can authentically say to the next generation, your turn. Anyway. Exactly. I think what you're saying on the Moses and Joshua is so cool in the sense of Moses wasn't teaching them, hey, here's what you do in the desert necessarily, as much as he says, here's what you do when you face something you don't know how to handle. You go get in the tent of meeting and you stay there until you hear from God. Whatever God tells you to do, you step out and do it, even if it doesn't make sense. That's the principle that was taught. And so what happens sometimes generationally where we get a conflict is we're more teaching our methods than we are the mission. We're, we're stuck on the strategic uh, things in, or, or the, the patterns of how we do it rather than the principles of here's what you do when you don't know what to do. Yeah. Here's the face of God. Here's how you take steps of faith. Watch me in this. That's what was taught because you're right. Everything that Joshua was, was doing is totally different than what Moses was doing. Mm. But he yeah. taught him, what do you do when you don't know what to do? What, how do you trust God? How do you hear from God? And then all our whole job is, hey, look, the whole deal is Paul saying, follow me as I follow Christ. That's what leadership is. So yeah. if I'm going to raise up spiritual leaders, spiritual fathers and mothers, then what I'm going to do is say, look, you don't declare yourself as a leader. You declare yourself as a lead follower. I pray first. I listen first. I sacrifice first. I step out first. And so then I'm going to call you to go seek God, who Christ, who's the head of the church. And let's all get on our knees and say, not my will, your will. And then we'll walk in unity together. That's, that's what it is. It's that principle. So I don't have to teach, how do you do church? I say, how do you do this spiritual leadership life of being the lead follower, hearing from God and doing that? Yeah. You know, when we were uh, at your church, we were there for a few days, not, not very long, but you could tell, and even from talking to people, um, you know, our, our friend Andy uh, and his wife, and um, you know, it was very evident that they all felt very empowered to be their own selves their own leaders um that it wasn't this one guy at the top dictating Mm -hmm. to everyone else how they had to be what they had to do etc obviously you have a dna which everyone kind of lives within um you said uh, you know we've heard this quote but you've also said along the way there were times you know you you were struggling with you know the want for fame and to be successful and, and all that kind of stuff now over the years of pastoring the church, have you always led it in such a way which it rose other people up and they felt they had that freedom to be that way? Have you passed it in a way which at times maybe it wasn't, it was you weren't as secure maybe as a leader and people felt like maybe they were being held back? If you did, what helped you to transition your, your leadership style to help elevate other people more? Yeah, uh, everything, uh, the big switches in my life, the answer is I haven't always led that way. And and that's when the Father lovingly by the Holy Spirit come and deals with me. <laughs> so, you know, um, every uh, all those things have happened where God really kind of gets a hold of me. And I remember, you know, even though God, you know how it is, it's God gives you a word. And so you're going, I got it. And so now I've got it forever. But then you're going, no, it's layers of an onion. There's that you got it, but there's whole many other layers. And so it was two or three years after that dream that God dealt with me again. And he said, listen, son, you're, you're not pastoring the way I've called you to pastor. And I'm going, what are you talking about? And he said, um, you look at people as the machinery to accomplish your vision. Wow. At that point, I was the youth pastor, and I thought like this subconsciously. It wasn't like I would say it out loud, but I would get mad. Like, if you stupid kids would just get your act together and quit being so distracted by all the things of the world and go reach your friends for Jesus, we could really reach a lot of people, get them in here, disciple and grow this youth group. And I'd speak at conferences all over to tell them how to do it, and I could write books, and people would be helped. (laughs) But it was really about I could be known. Isn't that gross? Mm -hmm. And yet God dealt with me and he goes, hey, you see them as machinery to accomplish your vision when they're the vision itself. They are the vision. And I'm saying, okay, God, what are you saying? That He says, instead of trying to say, how can they help me achieve what I want? 
It's how can I help them achieve what God wants to do in them? And those things will be results. God's got a calling on each person. My job isn't to get them to fulfill my calling. That's using them. My goal is to help them to discover the call of God and the gifts in their life and to function within that communion with the Lord and to function in that. And as they do, the kingdom of God will increase, not for my glory, for his glory and his way, which means I have an open handed heart that says these aren't my people. They're your people. This isn't my church. It's your church, (laughs) you know, and and to, to empower them to help them to find what God's come to do. And you know what the biggest way that that turned for me is God told me I had to get up and confess that to everybody. Mm. And uh, we had a retreat coming up, Andrew. And at the retreat, the Lord told me to tell all the young people what he told me and then to wash their feet. (laughs) So I had buckets backstage and I got up and told him, I said, I didn't even know I was doing it. It's not like I don't love you guys. I do, but I got, I, I love myself more <laughs> and I just got messed up. Would you guys forgive me? And I want to just pray for each one of you and ask you individually to forgive me. Well, there's like 150 kids in the room. They waited for probably three hours in order for me to pray for each kid coming forward. And I remember Daphne, there were some of those little junior hires coming down and they're waiting for their turn. And they kneel down and I'm washing their feet. Said, oh, God, touch Alan. God, forgive me for how I've, I've felt. But God, I know there's a hand. And God just began to speak to me prophetically over their life. And I'm just speaking affirmation, washing their feet. And then as I'm crying, they'd start patting me on the head. going, <laughs> Oh, it's OK, Pastor Scott. You're not that bad. You're not that bad. We like you. <laughs> this guy's really overreacting. You know? <laughs> You know, yeah, exactly. You said, I think you're taking this too far. We thought you were a good youth writer, you know, but it was what God was doing deep in me. And with yeah. every person individually, it started being, this isn't a group, this is individuals. This isn't about what's accomplishing in me. It's what I'm God's using me to help come alive in them. And so I think everything that I've changed my whole mindset to is it's not about building my thing. It's about me helping others discover what God's called them to do and do it. And that is my thing. You know, we, um, in our conferences, one of the things we, we take, um, it's Bible, 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 because this message is, is Genesis to Revelation. It, it's, it's it. It, it's not new. And when he says I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the beginning end of what? The the generations, Isaiah 41.4, yeah. who is he calling forth the generations, etc. So it's right the way through. So, you know, usually, especially our first conference is just Bible, 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 Bible. And one of the things we label is that to reach the, the uh, discipling the next generation isn't a calling. It isn't an office. It's a command by God. One generation shall tell the next generation. Now, a bit of a twist on what we're saying here is take, for example, the last place we were at the conference. We we went up and we spoke with a lot of young adults and probably older teens. And we said to them, I want you to be really honest with us, really honest with them. How many of you wish you had an older adult to father you, to mentor you, to be there for you, just just to be in your life when you needed them. I think there was only about two hands stayed down. And and I hear and I see this heart cry. The older men with the younger men, there's a generation of young men out there desperate for fathers. The older women with the younger women, this thing goes right the way through the church. Then here's the but in the middle of all this. It is so often so hard to find these people who are prepared to be there for the next generation, whether it's spiritual or natural. And when you do find them, it, it's like it can all go wrong so quickly. So I'll just give you one example for hear your take on this. And um, Somebody came to me and said, oh, yes, you know, I was at the conference and I felt convicted. So I took this young man and I said to him, now, I want to take you every week and I'm going to disciple you and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And he said, you didn't want it. So what shall I do? I said, 
you stop telling him what you're going to do and you be his friend. Exactly. And and it's like we speak. I mean, I'm not saying this. I'm. This is going to sound. This is going to sound like I'm flipping your statement up. But we speak to to, to tens of thousands, right? Right. To say right. to them, you know, you've got to rise up for the next generation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But how how do you convey the walking this out? And yeah. when there is such a heart cry for this, yeah. and and they can't find these people. I mean, I'm exactly. not expecting you to do a fix it, but it breaks my heart. Well, and we said to the leaders of that church, yeah, uh, we said to them, "Listen, we asked the young people this question. Ninety nine percent of them put their hands up. Now, when we leave, if you do not respond to the response that we got from the young people." it will be horrendous the damage caused will be unbelievable wish we'd so, never asked them yeah we yeah we shouldn't have even asked the young people if they weren't going to respond to it but uh, we left them a very serious challenge of, of responding to the, the heart cry of the young people there well can i just take a minute and, and talk about that you can, I think that's a big you can talk another half an hour about it <laughs> there's a big deal because of not only neglect in those areas, but abuse. Yes. So, you know, one of the things when people hear that I'm doing 415 and it's this movement for fathers and mothers, they go, well, what about the shepherding movement? You know, it can go bad and mm -hmm. there's control and all this. I'm said, I totally get it. That's not who we are. And not only that, you got so many, uh, so many people growing up without a dad in their home or having a dad in their home that's abusive, that doesn't bring really a good thought of father. So there's, everybody has different definitions when you say, hey, you need this mentor or father or mother. And everyone wants a good dad. and Everybody wants a great mom, but they're not even sure what that definition is. On the flip side, it's also because you haven't had that, they don't always know how to be that. Mm -hmm. and so, and if you haven't been discipled properly or in a healthy way, then you're going to not know how to do that for other people. You're just having to leave to get. So part of what's fallen on me and what's going on is God's put in my heart to kind of bring some definition to what biblical, healthy mentoring fathering looks like. And it won't take long, but I'll give you the four words that we share. Okay, you ready? I think We're it's listening. very. Number one is connect. Mentors and fathers and mothers don't wait for people to connect with them. Those kids don't go seek those people out. They need to seek them out. It's yeah. connect. But here's with every word and definition has a counterfeit. The counterfeit of connecting is using. Wow. So sometimes we'll go like, hey, I can see how I could use you. Hey, I see gifts in you. I see I can use you you know, or here's my agenda for you, like that gentleman has. That's not godly fathering or mothering or mentoring. That That is a counterfeit. Connecting means no strings attached. I want to know you and be in your life and be your friend. And my agenda is to help you win with what God's called you to be. You know, the Disney generation is, you can be anything you want to be, just dream it up. That's not true. I mean, if you're five foot three, you ain't playing in the NBA, okay? But you can be anything and everything that God's called you to be. So my job is to help you to discover that and to become that, but to connect with them. The second word is affirm. Affirmation. So like when you're talking about these dads or moms and what do I have supposed to do? I had all these things I was going to do. They didn't want to do it. No, you connect with them. No agenda except to help them and to love them and to encourage them. But affirming is huge. Now, affirming doesn't mean flattery. It isn't like, dude, I like your shoes. Hey, cool haircut, man. You know, you're trying to relate. And it's not flattery or like, man, you're so pretty or you're so handsome or you're so strong. No, affirmation is very much like 1 Corinthians 14, 3, prophecy. All prophecy is for encouragement, strength, and comfort. So it's when I look into uh, somebody's heart and I say to Andrew, Andrew, I see in you a deep seated heart to want to touch the next generation and even the desire you have to honor your mom, to be in relationship with your mom and to function together like this is to model out what it looks like. And, and you are modeling what true 
spirit led sonship to fathership, all of that is, I see it in you. You don't just say it. It is who you are. And there is a powerful anointing on your life in that. Okay. So that's real, but that's affirming. I was speaking to the heart of you. That is the God heart, the God person in you. Mm-hmm. It's Samuel coming to David's house. And even though David's dad, you know, Jesse didn't even have him lined up when Samuel said to have him all like, he didn't even think he was son king worthy. He wasn't even thinking he was son worthy, <laughs> but David comes before Samuel. Samuel goes, Whoa, there it is. I see it in you. I affirm that you are the one God has called to be the next king. You're the shepherd boy. Your dad forgot, but let me tell you who you really are. That's, I just want to jump in there quickly on that it. one. Cause do we it. use this Samuel and David, um, Samuel saw who David was before he even met him. And you remember when all the young men, were the brothers were standing there, they were going to sit down. And Samuel said, don't sit down. You do not sit down till David comes in. So he even had that honor and that everything. Yes. He saw who he was even before he saw him. Daphne, even the passage, what you're saying is so right on. It says he anointed him, and the passage says, in the midst of his brothers. <laughs> he says, I want you guys to get this. Why? Because he was psychologically jacked up from the abuse. He even writes in Psalm 69, I feel like a stranger in my home, like a rejected man upon my fam- uh, among my family. I mean, this guy's having trauma, and he's trying to reshape the paradigm and the narrative in his head uh, and what God wanted to speak in him. So sorry I interrupted, but you interrupt any time because you're genius. (laughs) Connect and affirm. Isn't that powerful? Mm. Very. Connect, affirm, guide. The counterfeit of guiding is controlling. Mm. So this isn't about, Hey, I've heard people say, Hey, if you want to be my son in the Lord, then you just need to make covenant with me. You're going to do what I tell you. Well, that isn't, that's not the true heart of a father. The true heart of the father is let's seek together what the father has for us. Mm -hmm. Let's walk together on what he has. Let me help you and encourage you. So what I do is even before I have a, a call with anybody I talk to, I say a little prayer before I get on the phone. I say, God, I pray that uh, I help them. Remember that you will not forsake them. You are with them. You will help them. You're their provision. You're their protection. You're their promotion. I pray when I get off this phone call or out of this meeting, they're more dependent upon you than they are on me. Why? Because my tendency, even as a father with my own sons and with anybody I love, is if they got, man, if I don't get $250,000, then they're going to kick me out of my building, a pastor might say. And I'm going, man, I, maybe I should call some guys and raise this money for him. But each time God tells me they're not your assignment to provide everything or to make everything happen. It's your job to say, hey, God's not going to let you down. This is a time not just to get the money or to get the building. This is the time to get the faith and to get in God's presence. He's not just building a building. He's building his people. Come on, God's not going to let you down and to encourage them. That is huge. Go, Daphne. Well done, Moses. Yes, exactly. What do you do when you're in a problem? Thank you. Thank you. So that, that, uh, uh, that's a big deal, you know? And, and sometimes people say, but I love them so much. I don't want them to fail. I don't want them to hurt. They're going to get hurt. They're going to hurt things. You know what I always think of is most of the biggest learnings in my life came from failure or came from me having to deal with something and so forth. So I'm not going to just let somebody look. I always think if somebody's going to wreck, I'm asking myself this question. Is it a train or a trike? Is it a tricycle? (laughs) If it's a train, then I'm going to dive in front of them and say, no, you can't do that. Okay, fine. There aren't a whole lot of trains in these situations. Most of them are tricycle issues. And most tricycle wrecks, you're you're not going to be damaged. You might get a scuffed up uh, leg or uh, uh, something like that. That's going to be a reminder and a help that causes you to learn. So be a dad and a mom that's wise to guide and not control. They're not mine. They're his. Yeah. The last so connect a firm guide, provide. Now, provide isn't about paying for all their bills, buying everything for them. That's spoiling. That's the counterfeit. 
<laughs> the counterfeit for provide is to spoil. But what I'm talking about is provide them opportunities, provide them a, a platform, perhaps right at the, when they're only 80% ready so they can get to 100%, provide them rooms to be in, provide people that they could meet that are further down the road that are going to be helps to them, provide material for them, provide uh, all, whatever it is that is for their growth. I see right now what they need is this. So I'm going to provide an opportunity, an environment for them to grow. That isn't about paying for everything, but it is about saying, how can I help this person have every opportunity on my shoulders a spiritual inheritance uh, instead of having to start from scratch. So that's kind of those definitions have helped me on these are what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to connect with them with no strings attached. This isn't about me. It's about helping them. I only win when they win affirming them. What is the God stuff I see in them that I can call out to emphasize in their life and then to guide them on, Hey God, there's no way God's going to let you down. Let's pray right now. I'm praying for you. I love you. He's going to teach us. He's going to show us. I don't know the answer right now. If I could, and sometimes I'll say, if I could right now, I would fix this whole deal. But I know God's got it. He's going to fix it better than me. So let's pray right now on it. Yeah. yeah. Can I add another one? I want you to. Do it. I'm going to write it down. Uh, you might not want it. <laughs> Fun. Fun. Come on. I, I mean... This thing gets so serious, it drowns people. If we, if we, well, I'm, right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to add that one. If we can't laugh with them, if we can't have fun with them, I mean... Everything's become very serious. I mean, I, I, I don't want to hang around people who can't laugh. I'm being honest. And if you're not laughing, I'm going to make you laugh because right. I can't do without it. So I just think that element of... of following Jesus has disappeared or the adventure. I mean, call it what you like, but something that... Right. Anyway, so... I mean, children didn't follow Jesus around because he was boring. Right. Exactly. Uh, I know that this whole provide one is a big, is a big one. And uh, even on one of our podcasts, uh, I can't remember who the person was we had on, but um, we were talking to him about his journey and how he got to the position he's in. And um, this whole provide thing came up and uh, I mean I could relate not so much within our ministry but there are other things that I've been involved with uh, but he shared you know just the struggle constant struggle when he would see older generations who had gone before him but refused to help open doors help him along the way and like I said it's not about spoiling but the next generation knows to, needs to know that you're there to help them along the journey, open doors if they need a door opening to help them along the way. And he was like, I, I saw no older generations helping me. I had to fight for everything that I've got today. And uh, and you spoke to him on the episode and, and just you know apologized on behalf of the older generations before him. But this is a big one. And uh, again, it, it, it takes... Uh, people to feel very secure in their own positions and in, in, in who they are to be willing to then use their position to open up the doors and bring other people with them. Well, God um, said to me once, I have given you a door through which others will find their path. Mm. And, and, you know, God has given us this to open for others to find their path and for us to, to welcome them through um, and to celebrate yeah. it's um yeah it it is tragic so, but comes from your own sense of this is mine doesn't it yeah it's a, it's in your identity and in whether you have security or not you know your your insecurities really hold you back here's what i always think of people cannot consistently act in a way that is inconsistent with how they gain self-worth say that again mm. slowly okay. People cannot can, uh, consistently act in a way that is inconsistent with how they gain self-worth. Wow. So I'm watch gonna, this. Watch I'm this. going to write that down. So what you're talking about here is opening doors for other people. If that's inconsistent with how I gain self-worth, like, man, if, if, they, if I open a door for them, that may be less doors for me. Hmm. If I give them an opportunity, people might like them better. In other words, 
pastors can't hand the mic out to someone if the whole way they gain self-worth is by having the mic. Hmm. People can't do transition and succession well when their whole life is wrapped up with their title, their position, and where they're at. So that's why in my 20s, like I told you, I started having the focus of my life the way I went is not how many mic times I have, but how many mics I can hand out, how many can get on my shoulders. The whole goal of my life is to help other people grow and every generation become bigger, better, and stronger in the kingdom. Think about Jesus and John 14, 12, when he says, if you believe in me, you will do greater works than I do. And he says, because I'm going to go to the Father and I'm going to intercede for you that you can get what you ask for. Three huge things there is he said, my whole goal is that you're going to do bigger things than me. That's what a dad thinks. Dads don't compete with sons. Mm. Brothers do, Mm. not dads. So he says, my whole goal, Jesus is the picture of the father. He says, hey, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. So here's the father's heart. I want every generation to get bigger and better. You're going to do greater things than me. That's what he said. The second thing he says, I want you to know you're going to do greater things than me. And then he he says, you are going to do it in such a way because I'm going to go to the father and I'm going to pray for you and intercede for you and give you everything that you asked for. I mean, think about that. He says, I'm going to provide and open up every door you need in order to accomplish that. That's what fathers do. They say, my whole goal is is that. And then guess what he says? For the, the glory of the father is in the son. So the third thing is, he says, the only way I win is you win. Absolutely. Mm. I, I think that thing of opening the door for others to find their path for me, I look, there is no presumption that if they go through the door, I open, they're even going to be like me. I mean, I'm not going to feel threatened by 99% of them because right. not, they can't be me. They never be me. And I don't expect them to be me. They're going to be who they are. And it may look totally different and it may be nothing to do with my ministry my mm. ministry our ministry the ministry right yes. so, so i think that's again a, a, an assumption when you open the door oh this is what it's going to be like um another thing you just said about but, I, but on that daphne yeah. that has nothing to do with rationale that has to do with a spiritual mindset and an insecurity i will not act in a way consistently that is mm. inconsistent with how I gain self-worth. My self-worth is about, if my self-worth is about the platform, the church, my title, what I'm doing, what I'm building, I'm not even thinking about helping anybody else. No. So yeah. the only way I'm going to consistently open doors for others is if my self-worth is lined up with the Lord's called me to be a dad. And when I see my sons thrive, that's it, you know. Mm. Yeah. And you were talking about handing the mic over in ministry, um, which I know you were talking figuratively as well as probably practically too. Yeah. yeah. But um, I we, we do a whole session on passing on j- transition. Um, I've forgotten what we call it, but transition in ministry, transitioning in pastors, etc. And I have your take on it again, obviously. But I think part of the problem is... People in ministry, or perhaps generally, don't recognise the shift in responsibility. So, for example, if, if a pastor is raising up somebody, a son, in ministry to take his place, or not to take his place, that's the wrong phrase, but raising up this son in ministry, that son in ministry should be raising up a son in ministry, right? Which means that original pastor is no longer a father, he is a grandfather. Yeah. And with this grandfather attitude, I, I'm still, I should still be honoured by the, the, the original son, he should still honour the grandfather. That there is a, if you translate that, which in the natural happens far more naturally, into the church, I think a lot of transitions would take place better. And it grieves my heart when I hear a new pastor who they've raised up saying, you have to leave now because this is mine. They should never have to leave. They're the grandfather forever in that situation. So I think 
we often put the chairs out and we move them along to show this because this again it's a fathering attitude mm. isn't it this was actually going to be my next question what? was saying you know people listening you know earlier on you talked about how you transitioned your church and so i was going to say is the next question how has that looked practically for you how have you because so often the person who takes over feels threatened feels like the person who's uh who was there is kind of still over watching over them making sure they're doing everything right uh, and so how has that looked for you because it's not even just with churches but in anything if someone's raised someone else up to take over there's hmm. there's still that dynamic between them so how, how have you managed that there's a lot of questions for you there Scott. <laughs> oh yeah but you know i think one of the let's start daphne where you're at i'm going to come to the practical but on the spiritual sense i think it's because we've struggled even with the apostolic definition of what is okay. it is modern day apostolic role. I think a, a spiritual apostle or the a, a apostolic anointing is kind of a, it's a fathering, a spiritual apostolic father, but it's also, it's not just about fathering sons. It's about fathering fathers. It's about raising up sons to be fathers and realizing that you're going to be a granddad real fast. And that's your whole role in life. Yeah. And, and so when, um, I, I think it, when we can get that in our hearts and our minds, I think people will transition more because they see there is a position in the body. It isn't the top rung is lead pastor. And then after that's a retirement and I'm out. No, it's at 52. I can transition. And I just got a promotion from the Lord. I am a spiritual apostolic father that is raising up other fathers. I am not just adding value in a church setting that to add to people who are going to add value. I'm adding value to people who are multiplying it with these mm -hmm. spiritual fathers. And so there is a role in the body of Christ for guys in their fifties and sixties to transition into this global pastor or into this apostolic position, whatever you're going to call it, founding pastor, uh, past, you know, global pastor, grandpa, whatever you're going to call it. There's a role there for that. The, when the way we did it practically is I went to our board and I told them that the Lord had told me that um, it was time for me to transition. Interestingly enough, here's how that happened. God told me Chris and Kara Rayleigh were to be the next people. And I go, well, that's great. I love them, but they're only eight years younger than me. <laughs> and so that means they're, they're 42, I'm 50. If they're going to take a church, it should be right now. This is the prime time for them to take a church not when I'm 60 and they're 52. And the Lord told me, he said, that's right. Isn't that what dads do? They make decisions, not just based on when they're ready, but based on when their sons are. Mm -hmm. And so the Lord said, if he's ready, you're ready. You're both ready. And so then I went to the board and I said, hey, I sense that the Lord has these guys as our next pastor. But I want to ask you, what do you have in your heart? I believe that God's calling us to be a church like Antioch. Who, who, after prayer and fasting, they set aside Paul and Barnabas and sent them out to do the work. And that was a ministry base there for those missionary efforts to go on. So Antioch had a vision, not just for their city, but for other churches to be launched and to be an apostolic center for that. And so our board bought into that. And I said, so when I approach Chris and Kara on it, what is the Lord saying to them? And we go through this process. It will be from the framework that I will become global pastor that has no say in the daily workings of the church, except for advising him as a spiritual father. I don't go to board meetings. I don't go to staff meetings. I'm in a different building than everybody else now, but they still let me have an office here. I'm in my office here on the uh, property, but it's in a different place. And I show up on Sundays. I preach six, seven times a year. And my role is to advise him, be a father to him, to help him. But he is the full on lead pastor of the church. But my assignment is to go and to raise up pastors to become spiritual fathers and mothers and connect them to church planners who will be with them for life. So right now in 18 months, because that's our focus, our Oaks Church ministry has multiplied in its impact because with me being that Paul and Barnes, they set aside Jenny and I doing that, we've raised up 51 
other large church pastor couples and train them to be fathers and mothers. And they've already taken on 36 different church plants just in this last year to start that are going to be, they're going to be with them for life. This has multiplied the effort. What if that kept happening over and over again, where pastors who feel the grace lifting don't say, but I don't have money but I don't know what I would do. Where would I go? But when the grace is lifting, they say, wait a minute, this is a time for me to step into this role as a spiritual grandpa, as an apostolic father, who's going to give wisdom here, but not just here to all these other, let's plant churches. Let's, let's take on other churches. Half the churches being planted in America have no covering at all. And the other half, only probably a half of them have somebody that's really doing it besides just signing a, a check to them. And so if we could raise this up in this position and function, man, it could be massively powerful. Wow. It is massively powerful. Yeah. Uh, if there are pastors listening to this um, and they're interested in what you're talking about, um, is this something that other churches can uh, join? Oh, yeah. Um, so what would that look like? Is that uh, just an America thing, a, a global Globally, well, here's what we're they? doing, which is kind of cool, Andrew. Is in March, every month we've had so many people call. Okay, so many people. I was just looking through the database today of people saying, "Hey, could you help us transition? Could you help us uh, talk about succession?" And and uh, so what we're going to do is start having every single month, starting in March, uh, uh, of a workshop, just a kind of a workshop at my house with five pastor couples, six pastor couples. It'll be an intimate, small group. And we're going to be teaching them all day <laughs> about it. And then those who say, can you help me get my plans together on how to do it and all that? Because listen, I think anybody who tries to transition without a mediator is asking for a problem. I don't, and what I mean by mediator is another spiritual voice, a fathering type person in the relationship between the two. Why? It becomes too emotional. It becomes too, you, you don't see things. You've never done it before. So to have somebody who can even ask the questions and help you to think through things you would have never thought of that you want to get in writing before. <laughs> so it's not confusing on the backside. Not only that, our mediator not only was there a year before helping us to do it in the transition, but we've kept him on a year and a half after the transition where he meets with Chris every month. He's available to me to call at any time. So if there's any question, any thought, any kind of, I don't know how to deal with this right now. This came up. How do I handle this? And, you know, he helps us on that. Anybody I know who does who tried to do transition without a mediator had a really rough time. And uh, so anyway, if somebody wanted to do it, you could just contact me. First of all, let me tell everybody on uh, Instagram is Scott Wilson seven. You could DM me anytime on there and we can talk. I look at that often. Uh, and, and, uh, but if you just get with us at that RSG leaders uh, on there, you can do that. Or just uh, call me, 469-223-9280. That's my cell. So uh, give me a call on that and I can help you. Hey, do you know what, uh, Daphne? I would really like, it. I'd like to give everybody a gift that's watching today. I'd like to give them my book. Uh, and uh, I hope this is going to work because I know we're international. And so we'll just <laughs> give it a try and see if we can do it. I don't know. But uh, if... If you'd like to get my book, I'll send it to you for free. Just give me your address. If you can help me with the shipping, <laughs> that would help me, but I'll give you the book for free. It's called Impact. So if you go to scottwilsonleaders.com, scottwilsonleaders.com, my new book on impact, that's how to gain influence in relationship with people. How to? It's all about respect and relationship. And how that works. And I've, I've talked about how I don't know how to do it naturally like my wife does. So I've had to create systems in my life to do it. And so I give the five ways I, grant, I gain respect in key leaders' lives and five ways that I gain a relationship. So I'm going to give that to you. Also on that, we have Ready, Set, Grow University. It's our monthly uh, master classes that we give out every month. And it's a monthly subscription deal. 
but we give a first month for free for people to check it out. So if you get the book, I'll give that to you for free. And if you don't like it, you can check out, you can get out, but just go to Scott Wilson leaders. Dot com. We have about 400 and some pastors that are on that every single month who are taking courses, giving it to their staff, and it's kind of their growth plan for what they're doing. But we just want to partner with people and help them. And so I hope those, I know we threw out all kinds of, I hope it's not too much. So people can go to that website and then presumably send a message, say, hey, I heard Scott on the Radical Lifestyle podcast. I want his book. Uh, and yep. then... And then we'll figure out the details. I gave them all kinds of way. They can DM me on Instagram, Scott Wilson Seven. They can call me on the phone number. They can uh, go to that website, and if they just even get it, we'll get it, and they can just let us know. I think um, we're about to head to states. I think we should go and knock on his door. And yeah, ask we should for probably do that. The yeah. Pack of yeah, that's you right. Bet, you, bet, <laughs> you got it. You, I'll give you two. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, I want to, as we finish, draw back to where you started about your father right and standing on his shoulders and the young man who said why would I build a house next door to my father when I can build on top to me the um I've got to choose my words carefully but there is nothing to compare with having parents who have discipled you who have raised you up and who launch you into all who God has called you to be and are there for a lifetime. There, There is nothing quite that can compare with that. You can have other fathers. I mean, I think of Paul and Timothy. Timothy had great family, but he needed Paul mm-hmm. because Paul gave him something his parents couldn't. He raised him in the right. apostolic ministry. So I'm not excluding other people. We need other people. But I just want to draw this back to back to the fact that you were blessed, I was blessed, hopefully Andrew's blessed. Sometimes. <laughs> by, <laughs> by having been raised up within the family and being discipled by our own parents. As we draw to a conclusion, can you just speak into that? You know, I think the principles we've talked about all work uh, in direct biological parenting yeah. and relationship and i always tried every which way i knew how to say i want to put my three sons before anything else in ministry they are my primary congregation my wife and my three sons and uh i it doesn't mean that everything is perfect or everything is is uh, regimented like that you know we're going to disciple here we're going to do this but it is a modeling of life. It is a mentoring in life and loving them. And I think the biggest thing is I tried to do these things here. I tried to connect with them every which way I could. I took initiative to them. When, when I saw them kind of moving away, I moved to them. I affirmed them where it wasn't just trying to be cute with them or, or teasing or whatever, but to affirm the greatness in them. I wanted to guide them. And that was a big deal because I tell you what, with my biological kids, when they started straying from the Lord, I wanted to say, bless God, if you don't get in here and get right, I'm going to take your car. I'm going to take it. And I'm talking about they're 24 years old, you know, (laughs) you know, and uh, it's just hard, but I'm telling you that is so huge. Unconditional love, especially as they're getting older, but the modeling of it, the mentoring of it, the encouragement of it, the, the, it, there's just nothing like it. And to even probably one of the greatest things I think my dad did for me and that I try to do with my kids is every time I kind of messed up or saw that I'd done something that wasn't the best, I called a family meeting and kind of self-disclosed and said, hey, I, I don't think I've been parenting <laughs> the way I need to here. And I want to ask you to forgive me. I'm going to do this. I, I tried to have those conversations. If I got something wrong, I tried to show what it looked like to be, a, uh, to be repentant and to change. And um, so I think what you're saying is huge. I also think there's a lot of people who don't have that in their life. So I'm talking about didn't have that or don't have that. And the scripture gives us a promise. The Lord says he'll be a father to the fatherless. That that doesn't just mean he'll be a dad to those who don't have a dad. It means he'll be a dad and a mom to you in the areas you didn't get 
what you needed from your dad and your mom. He'll fill every gap and he'll heal every wound. And so just any, and I think a lot of times when we don't father and mother the way we would hope to, sometimes that has to do with family of origin stuff in us that we don't even know how to deal with the hurts and the stuff that's inside of us. And you got to become a son before you can be a father. You got to become a daughter before you become a mother. We understand that biologically, but spiritually speaking, Mm. we've got to get that healing so that we can do that. And so I think one of the biggest things in my life is 25 years ago, I started going to counseling and I've been going every other week with my wife. We go for two hours the first hour is together and the second hour I stay around Andrew. So he can tell me kind of the things I missed in the first hour. <laughs> you did hear her say this, right? You know, uh, but really to grow. And that's been a key person in my growth team to help me because there's a lot of things that just are blind spots to me hmm. that I don't see deaf spots, yeah. dumb spots. But I think you're right. We've got to focus in on that gift that God's given us of our kids and to just love them and to help them and to teach them and to model what it looks like. Hey, if your kids grow up to pray like you, what kind of prayer life will they have? If they read the Bible like you, what kind of knowledge of the word will they have? If they walk in faith like you, what kind of faith will they have? Just if they're going to walk in the way, if you're, they're going to follow you as you follow Christ, what will that look like? Make it where they have to make choices to say, I'm not going to be like my dad, or I'm not going to be like that. They have a choice in it, but you lead the path of this is what it looks like. That's our job. Scott, thank you so much. Uh, There is a lot of food for thought for people, and um, we really appreciate you taking the time. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I'm telling you right now, being with the two of you pumps me up every single time. (laughs) You are a joy because I think you are right smack dab in the middle of God's heart. Thank you, Scott. We'd love to have you back sometime and we can dive dive into a, yeah. a whole other load of subjects. So thank you. Let's thank do you. it. Thank you for listening to this episode. If it inspired you, please rate us and subscribe on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify, or another podcast platform.